not only is the world big enough for everybody, take it a little bit further, that everything exists locally. There is no serious revolutionary question. There is no responsive intellectual question of does blank exist? People who would say that they have some sort of personal knowledge of a God. It's not a question of whether God exists, a God. It's not a question of whether UFOs exist. It's not a question, if you really want to get slippery, of whether you exist. Because locally, everything exists. There is a local reality to any idea that has a proponent. There is another kind of reality to it, to any idea that has an antagonistic response from some other human. You have then, without any doubt, without any kind of discussion, without any question as to truth, validity, utilitarianism, you are simply confronted with the fact that locally everything exists. There is no way to separate the local reality of the intellect from any notion of what exists. Now, of course, as always, this is somewhere between foolish and dangerous in the ordinary world because there has to be a kind of stable paradigm of what is reality, even locally, although they don't use the term, but there has to be a kind of institutionalized community reality everywhere. If it wasn't, then who would psychiatrists and those who run the funny farms and service the shock machines, what would they do for a living? There has to be a kind of institutionalized, middle of the bell curve, combined local reality. But they do not see beyond that that local reality takes in anything that life makes the human nervous system think of. Even in the ordinary world, which is not the purview of this kind of activity, you would have to note that if you were too involved with a local reality that was too localized, that is, if you in fact not only believed that you were seeing flying saucers, but that they were coming in at night and miniaturizing themselves and flying into your ear and leaving some kind of messages in your dream and then flying out first thing in the morning before anybody can catch them. <laughs> now, if you thought that, which is your prerogative, if you thought that, that would be your local reality, but if it gets too far removed and you tried to spread that word, I would suggest to you that it could probably have a pejorative effect upon your standing in the neighborhood, perhaps your job, perhaps any chance for you running for local or national office. So even there, it would still be serving a purpose because you would then probably end up taking up a bed or using up one of those jackets that have those real long arms on them. So they wouldn't be going to waste. But looked at from even the middle of the bell curve, do you understand that the question and let's assume that all of you are at least on a warm day, sort of in the middle of the intellectual bell curve of our time and place, that any idea that runs through you that seems to demand some response on your part or some concern, such as how can people believe that they're talking to God? How can people believe that they're seeing flying saucers when there's no <coughs> physical proof? How can people believe anything? How can they think that when it's obviously not true? Now, even in the middle of the bell curves, I sing back in life, which is not our concern, but I wanted to point out that is a kind of very uncomfortable merry-go-round because you can't ever come to a satisfactory conclusion other than saying, well, they're crazy. When what you're saying is they're in some way, they have some notion of a local reality that is so far removed from mine, and mine is so close to the median, or the medium, that they are, in fact, nuts. But that is not even satisfying. That is not even satisfying to life inside of its institutions. That is, they cannot even, psychiatry, the art, if not the science, of mental health cannot come to any kind of firm conclusion as to what is intolerably insane. They can't do it legally. And at least legally, they can decide all sorts of other things. 
But no one can come to a firm conclusion as to when someone is absolutely insane. Everyone has a notion, if they're confronted with it, that some other person is so insane I don't want to be around them. We're going to have to get Uncle Hubert out of the house. He's driving me nuts with all this talk about hearing voices. But insofar as being able to decide, they can't. Because life can't decide. And the reason life can't decide is, I start to tell you, that life is big enough for everybody. <laughs> that is, locally, everything exists. The universe, the universal, is big enough for all localities. Now, when it gets into the area of trying to do something out of the ordinary, when you can no longer snivel or swing at the insanity of other people, that is, their local reality, and even if the local reality seems to be taking on a larger face and you begin to feel that you may be swapped, that there are growing numbers of people that are beginning to believe a certain thing. Friends, if you're living in a day and time that it appeared to be that the social and political climate began to go through one of these swings again, as it's normally noted in the 3D world, it seems to be flowing back to a kind of conservative stance in you just left your own general wiring devices may feel as though, boy, I wish I wasn't alive right now or I should move to Spain now that Franco seems to be seriously dead. <laughs> Maybe I should get away from this because I am now surrounded by an increasing, although they're now they're college educated, they're nothing but a bunch of lard-ass rednecks and conservatives and very limited people in their view of society and culture. That is a form of thing as though insanity is creeping up on you. That is that you and perhaps most of your peers were sane up until a few weeks back, up until such and such happened. And now I seem to be not just having one or two fairly ragged intellectual people about me. They seem to be gathering up in packs and they may take over. That sort of thing comes with age in the 3D world. And sometimes it comes about beyond age that people live in a certain time and life will make them recognize that they're going through one of these cyclical periods again. So it's bad enough for ordinary people to get old, which I guess most of you notice is there's a lot of it going around. Just, <laughs> just year after year people get older. I'm talking about ordinary people. And if they're doing that plus feeling as though, thinking that they're living at the cusp of some cyclical period, then they can feel that the stray dogs that were around are beginning to collect and they may take over. And so people can feel doubly diswrought. Poor old people. You have got to see that it has no validity. You have got to see that there, the reason it cannot be answered as to what's valid, what's sane, what exists. Does somebody does a God exist that talks to this person over here? They seem relatively sane, except you get them started on that, and the guy says, oh yeah, I talk to God. Yeah. He doesn't all the time answer, but I talk to him, and sometimes he talks back, and you might go, Jesus. It's not even any question. It's not a matter of yes or no. There is no answer to it, any more than saying, was that person insane, which is the same kind of question. Is that person nuts for saying that? The universal is big enough for all localities. Where do you think the localities came from? Where do you think your sanity came from? Where do you think that everybody else's questionable sanity came from? It all came off the same, out of the same store, it came from different shelves. But it's all right off the rack. It's not tailor-made, it's not a bespoke intellect you got. You may think it is, but it's right off the rack. And what appears to be your reality is your reality. Now, see if you can expand this. The past is big enough for everybody. R was noted some one of our recent meetings. The past has something for everybody. No, wait a minute. The past has everything for everybody. This is not the same thing as saying that the world is big enough for everybody. Well, sure it is. But plaque it's not, so you can try to see it, a slightly different aspect of it. The past is big enough for everybody, which I'd suggest is again why humans love the past. 
as if they had a choice. But just still speaking as though we're sort of ordinarily using the language, is people love the past because it has something for everybody. Now you can think about the future, you can try your best, and one of the real insufferable possibilities to the future, at least to most people, is that it's darn likely, if you think about the future far enough, that I won't be here. But the past has something for everybody. The past is your best friend. Because you can find anything you want to in the past. The future, I guess on a good day or a few drinks or something, you can dream, yes, I bet someday somebody's just going to suddenly trip over that shoebox of those symphonies that are under my bed and suddenly go, my God, and they'll begin to whistle it or read it in their head and I'll be discovered. That's possible. Don't have two or three more drinks. or, the, But you can think that of the future in passing. But the real thought of the future, about their closest, that seems to be certain if when somebody tries to think about the future is how the intellect come up with me actually laying down and dying and not being here. It's not so much not being here, but I won't be aware. The future holds nothing. The past holds everything. The past is big enough for everything. It is what seems to be a kind of reconstitution of the past, which has been noted by psychiatry and psychology, Greek dramatists and everyone else, that people make up the past, that people forget what happened, that people are unreliable witnesses, even when they're eyewitnesses to a murder that happened a week ago. Forget a year ago, they can't identify the person anymore because people make up, they just twist the past that's not the way to look at it. Now, if this was involved, or if we were involved in some way in attacking humanity, if this had a premise, like things are not right, that is, you're not right, and you know it, and things should be put right, and you know it, if that was a premise, then we could attack people's memory and say everyone remembers that they won the argument. Everyone remembers that any harsh feeling now exit between you and someone else, everybody remembers exactly what happened, and it was their fault. Now, you could do that if this was psychology. And in that case, you could say, from that view, that the memory, ordinary memory, is probably people's, if not their worst enemy, it's a very questionable ally. It's a very suspect weapon because it's so unreliable and that subconsciously, unconsciously, we try and twist the past to suit our own purposes. You know, yak, 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 yak. I'm going to tell you. The past is your friend, if you're ordinary. The past is your best friend. Who else will never let you down? <laughs> well, let's take the way that I was just speaking for ordinary intelligence and in saying that people can go back if we were taking an ordinarily psychologically verbalized view and say, well, people just twist the past and remember selectively what they want to. Well, my God, you don't, look, you don't see what a boon that is? Who else will let you do that? You can't actually go to the people. You can't go to your mother and say, Mom? And she says, who are you? And you say, well, it's me. And well, Gottlieb, you remember? I know we hadn't spoken in 35 years. And I wanted to tell you, I think, since we're both probably going to die soon, why don't we get over this and just admit it was your fault? <laughs> you know, your mother's going to tell you, I don't know how your mother would speak to you, but she'd probably tell you uh, to stuff it. Or let's wait another 35 years before you call back. <laughs> All right? That's your own mother. But if you don't do that, if you just think about it, you can picture your mother that if you did call her, of course she died last week, but if you called her now, if you called her now and said, you know why we hadn't spoken all these years, or if you just said, hello, it's Gottlieb, she'd immediately break down and say, oh, please forgive me, I was hoping you'd call because I can't stand the way I treated you. Now don't look at that as, in some psychological way, as, well, that would be humans twisting the past to suit their own egocentric purposes. Look at it this way, the past is a friend. The past will do for you what your own mother wouldn't, according to my example, which is a pretty good example, knowing some of you. The past will agree to anything. The past has something for everybody. The past will make, you put together Kmarts, Walmarts, Gimbals, and they can't begin to compete with the past. You just wander in, and it's got something for everybody. Or as I did it before, no, it's got everything for everybody. It's big enough for everything and everybody. You cannot overstuff the past.
about all the ideas that men have always had about gods and uh, mythological creatures? Uh, one or the other. Fairly worldwide salient aspects of the descriptions of gods are once some group somewhere has a god, among the other things they point out about him or her, is that the God is all things to all people. What did I just describe? That under any kind of three-dimensional intelligence, a usable God, a usable idea of a God for a group of ordinarily thinking people would be that the God would have to be all things to all people, at least that group that are trying to pursue this particular God. But rather than look at that as being some totally unfathomable aspect of how can, what a great guy that God is, that I can't do that and my brother can't do that, that he can be all things to all people. Hell, the past can do that. I was trying to get some of you to somewhere in your own brain go, wait a minute. Not necessarily say, well, that means the past could be synonymous with the idea of God. Mm-hmm. Nothing is synonymous with anything else. There are, th- there are things that are better dancing partners with each other than with other things, and there are things that dance together in a way that will take your breath away, except you never see them. They're whirling away, and they're inside of another dimension. all the beauty of the past I would suggest that someone attempting to do this sort of thing would find that there is the past holds nothing that includes the present but the past holds nothing that's of any useful interest if you're going anywhere it just seems as though it does it just seems as though that you have got to consider the past because if we don't know where we've been we will never know where we're going that old one or the one that's even better (laughs) is those who do not know the past are doomed to repeat it (laughs) aren't you glad that you're exempt from that or aren't we delighted that the guy who said that that obviously understood it was exempt from that it's a shame he died but he, his name was so large, I think it just kind of weighted him down. Something else, if you can find the connection. It was noted the last time we were meeting. The idea, or the fact of men being drawn to the idea that in here they are so large and so complex as to be or that they're just so ineffably complex that they can't be understood here is a place where it is a perfect unrecognized dancing partner with another aspect of believing that you are so complex individual and human but you're so complex that you can't be described. You can't, cannot be understood. It is the perfect dancing partner also with the notion that out there is indescribably multifarious. It's perfect. Nobody can understand life. Everybody agrees to that. The best you can hope for is to maybe get your master's degree, <laughs> maybe get your PhD and write a paper here and there and become an expert on one part of one day of a three-day life cycle recently discovered subterranean bacteria. <laughs> well, you know how it goes. Or become the expert on the fifth leg of some new grasshopper, some new insect they just discovered in the Amazon forest. It is just simply accepted that life out there Somebody's loose. (laughs) 
Is he all right? That life out there is so complex that no one human can understand it. It cannot be grasped. But you see that it is a perfect dancing partner. It's not one causes the other. But then, to think that, to expect that individuals, intellectual, this force-fed intellectual idea and attitude toward oneself, can you conceive it would be any different? But now you should see that it can't. But now you should have your own way to begin to sneak up on such as this when you recognize that what seems to be the barrier or the threshold between in here and out there is nothing other than your own intelligence. And to believe that water coming in through a fish's gills comes in as water, and as soon as it gets through the little gill and comes in, and then it becomes Don Perignon, you know, you're not that crazy. Water in, water out. So how could it be? It is just a perfect just an excellent tango partnership that I am so complex, so big, so complex internally that I can work on trying to study myself, come up with little ideas and some suspicions I have, especially the more I read about the statistics of other people's psychology, the more I... You people quit laughing at that, <laughs> which either frightens me or inspires me. But how could it be that you would expect that somebody would think that, which all people do, more or less, the general wiring is, and then think otherwise? You could not look out at life and find life to be, hey, now that I look at life, it's pretty straightforward, it's pretty obvious, now I got it. And then look internally and go, ooh, boy, I wish I was that simple. It's just a perfect partnership. Also, how about a, an aside? Do you realize that a small, simple person would not be driven to tell you what kind of guy they are? And all of you are supposed to realize now that that is one of the continuing motifs of everyone's own life symphony is to over and over sing what kind of guy I am. Not what kind of fool am I, but what kind of guy I am. <laughs> but if you were wired up, and there are people like this, is when I said generally, at least you think you're missing the point, there are people wired up that are almost walking poster boys for sniveling. <laughs> Three-dimensional humility. All of you have known somebody like that, and let's not even go into the possibility that some of you brought some of that kind of baggage with you here. But the kind of people are just, well, I'm just a nobody. I'm sure that if life, if, if the gods had any occasion to ever notice me, I'm sure they'd just look and laugh and probably go and step on me. You know, I'm of I'm absolutely no significance. Right? The people like that do not even go around talking about how insignificant they are. Now, there are people who say that, but they're not simple. Try it another way. This wasn't that complex. I just thought some of you would see that this energy can be described and seen from other ways, the kind of energy that fuels making people tell you what kind of guy they are. That makes you want to tell what kind of guy you are. It's got nothing to do with ego. It's got nothing to do with your childhood. It's got something to do with something else. But one of it is, if you did not have the notion that you were inevitably complex, then you would not be telling what kind of guy you are by word and deed, by insinuation, by look. You have got to have that notion that I am so complex that I'm just indescribable. I cannot be understood. What else would you, how else would ordinary people entertain another person telling, going into that kind of social dance of, well, I'll tell you the kind of guy I am, and you tell, and the other person stands going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You get through and they say, well, you know, sometimes I feel that way, but I don't know. I guess, the kind of guy, I guess, when it gets down to it, I know what you're talking about, but when it gets down to it, all right, I tell you, this is kind of the way I look at it. And then you do it, and they go, dun, 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 dun. They kind of skate along backwards, and you dance. But if you were just a simple, very small person, what would you have to tell? Other than if you could, if this was a three-dimensional 
absolute correct fact other than say as everybody waited for a second is what kind of guy you are you just have to say well I'm so simple there's nothing to tell oh okay now that could not be widespread you understand because if it's widespread then people would cease to be telling other people what kind of guy they are and there would be some seriously used necessary energy would suddenly be lacking it would be like jerking octane out of your firebirds and Porsches and dropping it down to I guess around what 40 octane life would begin to peter out without people telling what kind of guy they are and people would not tell what kind of guy they are unless they were so complex that they will even sing what seems to be questionable verbal songs about themselves like well I'm so complex in fact I'll tell you the truth I try to do good I try to treat my family right but you may understand this you're pretty sophisticated it's like at times there's something in me it's not a deadly drive but I will in fact almost hurt the things I cherish and as they all stand around drinking their daiquiris or sidecars or <laughs> barley harvangers or whatever they are now everybody <laughs> nod yes yes I know how yes oh. that's a sign you're complex that I do things even I don't know why Jesus what's wrong with me <laughs> almost a, be a modern character in a Shakespeare drama ah oh, the complexity of it all the main reason I took that aside was to see that what seems to operate in here is always a perfect dancing partner. If you want a simple way, I can start and say a reflection, but it's really more than that. You should be shocked to find your own self going along with any continuing feeling that you have or any belief you have that in any area, that out there is going to be widely different from in here, no matter how it's described, no matter how you think about it. It is a perfect kind of dancing going on. Some of the people seeing this on tape uh, continue to write me, and I keep promising to speak more along the area of electronic home consumer products. And so I guess <laughs> I, know, I know how much it means to some of you. All right, so here's another one. Here's another one. Spatially, amplifiers do this. They take a low signal that has info, and they mix it as low voltage, but low power signal that has info, and they mix it. All good spatial amps, or any spatial amp, has two inputs and one output. That's just the bare minimum for an amplifier, and it takes in a low signal, low power signal that has some info, mixes it with a high-powered signal that has no info, then sends it out, is high voltage, high power signal with info. The turntable, the voltage of the signal coming off, if you're talking about an analog record, coming off is very low. I mean, you put your ear down and you can almost hear something going on, which you'd be hard pressed to throw a party or to sit there alone. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes through on the preamp and the anyway, it gets to the amp, and there is the signal, very low power. It's minuscule wattage, but low power, but it's got the info. It's got the sound already there. Then it takes, coming from your AC line, it takes high power that has no information. And it mixes the two, and then it sends out high-powered, high-voltage, high-powered output that now is carrying the signal with it. Of course, I lied. Nobody's written to ask me to talk more about home audio products except that one person I won't mention. <laughs> Can you jump from there into the enthusiasm of the human nervous system into the limbic aspect of the human nervous system dash intellect and you're dealing with what's normally referred to as enthusiasm. It serves to take, it's not an unwarranted parallel, I'm going to draw for it, that what seems to be the enthusiasm of individual people will take signals they've got, that is, energy that has some sort of information. Now, of course, ordinary people take it seriously. They believe it's what they're interested in or what they want to do. But it's a signal. And it's got information of some kind, but it seems to be low-powered, and then I'll call it enthusiasm here for just a little bit until maybe I can drag some of you further. 
but what we normally refer to as enthusiasm, then propels this, when it's necessary, into like a more cogent overdrive, for instance. A salesman's enthusiasm having to compensate for some shoddy product or trying to make up for some lackluster backup ad campaign that the new product, the new line of cars or dresses or computers or whatever it is, either the, the product itself he finds questionable. Or they show him, all right, we'll be hitting the print, media, and TV Monday, and here's the ad. Maybe he and a few of his friends look it over and think, Jesus, now I could be wrong. They get paid for this. But if we're going to sell this, they all have a few drinks there on Friday afternoon. If we're going to sell this, we're going to have to put them in the car and hit the streets Monday. And we might as well forget this as far as I'm concerned. I don't think this is going to help. It's, well, what we're going to have to do is get in with, Hi there! <laughs> now, I'm not using enthusiasm and using that salesman example to make any negative commentary. It's not that. And it's not limited to me saying a salesman having to use enthusiasm to compensate for a shoddy product. The shoddy product, well, I just thought would be the easiest way to start this. It doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the product or the service necessarily. It has to do with this kind of question that you should be trying to see. Is the kind of energies that go through you continually, the things you think about. And ordinary people would say, including the things they think they feel. But the things you think about, and you think, well, maybe I'll do that. Or maybe I should consider doing that. How much of the things do you ever do? How much of the things do you even think about a second time? And that is the second time has any more propulsion behind it than the first time. I don't mean that you hadn't sit around for God knows a million to what degree times you have thought about. Boy, had be to be making a million dollars a day tax-free. Boy, what would it be like to walk in to a blank, a club, a stadium, whatever it is, a symphony hall, and as soon as I walk in, people gasp and say, it's him, it's her. Or I walk down the street or past a bookstore and suddenly faces come out of the store and they look down at the book that's number two with a bullet on the New York Times bestseller list and they say, it's him, it's him, or it's her. I don't mean those that just go over and over and over and over that do not change the power of the output. But how many things have you apparently selected to do in life? If you're ordinary, you'd believe that. That, well, I can't do everything I've dreamed about. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a fireman, a ballet dancer, a cartoonist, and a transvestite. That was just a joke. <laughs> and a princess. I was trying to include men and women. <laughs> I, guess I, I guess I did at least that. And then it's like you get to a certain age, and you didn't think it this way, right after the fact that somebody said, well, why did you decide to become a fireman instead of a ballerina? And you immediately had to say, well, I found out that my toes wouldn't take it. But the point is, all of you people know, but now there was not any place along the line that you in some way stood or sat or laid down and said, well, let's see. I got it narrowed down. I'll either become a brain surgeon or a harmonica repairman. <laughs> there was not some spot that you decided that. But it seemed as though your enthusiasm, that is, it seemed as though your interest won out somewhere. <laughs> I'm still pointing or attempting to point in a way that I can tell most of you are not getting and I'll take some of the blame by making you laugh. No, I won't. You didn't have to laugh. So let me try off to the side here for a second and see if we can slip back up on it. In a future, and by that I'm inferring not in the future, but in a future, that is that somebody might be able to proceed along individual with this and have their own nervous system operating outside the spatial limits of right now. In a future, I would suggest to you that new info, revolutionary, just new info that you did not have available would be its own high power info signal 
it would furnish its own needed enthusiasm fuel, the information itself, not even the appearance of you, that is the individual, trying to decide its worth, its validity. What importance should I place upon this? Or should I talk myself into it? Such as being at a football game, you know, go team, go team. I won't drink, I won't drink. Or, no, I won't smoke, I won't smoke, I won't smoke. Or dear God, dear God, dear God, dear. That is enthusiasm. That's attempting to take a signal with some kind of information that's at a low power, a low voltage, and then to try and compensate. Life is needing it at, at the output coming through you, which is what the transmission of energy is about, that some of it you are supposed to amplify, you individually. And there is a parallel between what I started out describing, those kind of consumer electronic products such as an amplifier that actually takes in two signals and mixes them and sends out one that is a combination. But the two signals are that one of them, back to the electronic picture, one of the signals is just power. It's the higher power of the two signals, but it's carrying no information. It's just raw power. Then the other signal is going to be mixed with it is carrying the information, but it's always of a low power. If any of you are still thinking you're missing it, I can suggest this way. That all of the info is always of low power, and the degree of the power is within fairly confined limits. That is, it doesn't vary that much. I'm just trying to suggest to you like throwing the milk down in your pants leg. <laughs> but people, if anybody was understanding this in the ordinary world, even when I'm talking about generally, they would say, no, that's not true. What you were talking about is in a future that information itself would carry its own enthusiasm. That's not true because some things now, just in ordinary life, are enthusiastic. Like, I am a I'm a real Christian. I'm, I'm a Republican. Or I love my family. I don't care much about my job, but look behind me here on my desk at my beautiful wife and my three darling children. Or is it my darling wife and three beautiful children? I can't keep up with the latest. And they would say there's certain ideas, though, in life. When I think about my religion, when I think about my culture, when I think about my political persuasion, I'm just automatically enthusiastic. That's not true. And you should know that. You should not from your own nervous system. Now, there is a, it's not that the people are absolutely blind and idiots, because if you had not looked any further, if there was not the possibility of you seeing a little more into that unproven assertion that humans are so complex there's nowhere to start looking, for you to see that at the surface, you would think, if you didn't know better, that there have been, or may continue to be, flows through you that is fields of areas of interest you have that seem to be high-powered in and of themselves. It's not true. That's why they're shaky. That's why you can lose them. That's why people are, is, I'm just going to use some real quick ones before we run out of time, people will say that they don't want their children or even themselves at times to be exposed to seriously contradictory beliefs or ideas. No, I'm not against, I'm not for censorship. But I don't want my children being raised. Here I am, a good Baptist or a good Muslim. I don't want my children being raised by teachers who are atheists. I don't want my children seeing television shows or movies that have ideas that will upset them. Now, it sounds defensible. But then there are people who will say that they don't want to. Why should I go and watch a movie that's about there's a, there's an attack on Muhammad when I am a fervent Muslim? Why should I do that? I am so enthusiastic, there's nothing they could say that would shake my faith in Islam. So why should I go see such a bunch of trash? Why should I read that? My enthusiasm, it can't be attacked. Now, all of this has no psychological validity. That is not the reason going on. But I was trying to get you to see that people believe, they say that there are areas of interest, that there are information signals that would be going through them now that are per se, that are intrinsically to them high powered. And it's not true. And you should know it. 
All right, I'll be real crude. It's not pessimism, as you know by now. It's not to give you the blues, but think about the kinds of things, the interests that you've had normally in life. Great love affairs. The first time you got hold of a brand new guitar. Or to finally buy a sports car. And for you people on tape, I repeat, this has got nothing to do with attacking material goods and hobbies in life. But that kind of, what it amounts to, from a more complex view, is a kind of phantom energy. Which, if you ever find, remember, if that ever hits across, at least across the counter, if not the stock exchange, buy low. <laughs> if they ever discover the source of phantom energy, buy into it now, trust me. Buy in and hold on, don't sell. But it's kind of a phantom energy. The enthusiasm of, oh yeah, let's do that. Or the enthusiasm, no attack on love, especially eroticism. But that kind of enthusiasm that people have initially in a brand new love affair, in a brand new love affair with a human, with a car, with a hobby, with a new home, with a new job. And all of you should know by now, without any form of heartbreak or getting the blues, that all of that kind of enthusiasm is very shaky. Almost all humans in the general area of the bell curve would know this. I wouldn't go tell them, but almost all of them know it. It's that, it's that kind of feeling that sometimes it comes out that, boy, I'm so happy, I know I'm going to pay for this. Or, boy, this is, this is so much fun, I just know that God just set me up you know, to trip me good. It's that kind of feeling. And it's based upon, what I'm telling you, that that which normally flows through humans, that part of the reason that they are transferring machines, you can look at them as being amplifiers. Sometimes it's almost a reduction, which I didn't want to get into. But the amplifier is a decent parallel because it is not just the energy running through you that propels itself. The energy running through you and everyone else at the ordinary level comes in, that which is carrying info. It comes in almost just within little small confines at a very low wattage. And it's up to you, the way you're wired up, to take certain ones of them and you add energy that has no particular information, just raw energy. And I'd suggest to you another place where the combination, as I've described, of the primary and the secondary comes to play. You can look at the primary energies as being the mute, raw, the wet brain energies, that have no particular information, at least not verbally. They, it does not speak. It's just raw power. Just turn on an amplifier at home, just turn it up, and they'll blow everything out. It's just turning out power, putting out no no, I mean, putting out no music, putting out no signal, not that it has any information. Just power. You could look at that area of the human nervous system that I referred to as the primary area, even the wet brain, is being that, and then that which is outside, added on to, in addition to, in some way, still within the universal of it, but in some way, discernibly different, at least to intellectual perception. There's information, there's signals coming in that carries information, but it does not have, and I'm saying information, information that the brain can perceive, which is secondary. And it's like it lacks something. What does it lack? I've, I've got great ideas. I've written a hundred great symphonies. Oh, all right, two in my head. <laughs> I've written a great novel. Well, I hadn't actually got it on paper, but it's a knockout. It, I mean, it'd shoot right to the top. Why don't I do it? Oh, I don't know. I think about it, and I've, I've got... I swear, if you heard it, you would agree that this would have to be a hot shot book. Or maybe I can make a screenplay out of it instead of writing the whole book. This thing would be murder. What's lacking? I, don't, I just can't seem to make myself do it. I don't seem to have, oh, I don't know, the enthusiasm. It is this kind of low-powered signals running through the human nervous system here, carrying info, but at low wattage, low voltage, low power. And it gets mixed when it's appropriate, when life needs it, with that second input native to an amplifier. And then it mixes it and sends it out. In your home unit, when I say sends it out, of course, it goes out of the back of the amplifier where it says speaker terminals and it runs it to the speaker. And now you can hear that which is coming off the record or the CD, which you hear that which starts out 
that that signal is very low. It's not even really useful, but it's got the information. And it mixes it with the raw signal, a powerful signal that carries no information. It mixes it and runs them to the speaker, and then you can hear it, blow the walls down, run your neighbors off, and break your lease. There is info, which I was, of course, hanging that you can plug into if you can get your brain operating. If you can find a place that you can crank up an amplifier into an area that you didn't even know that it picked up, that you didn't know in which it operated, there is information that comes very close to what ordinary people believe, as I've already said, that they'd believe that there is some, some kinds of information, that which seems to be to them uh, most dear, most important, whether it be religious, political, kinship, but there is a kind of information that is, is not normally available, but is and of itself already high signal. It's got info and it's already high power. I would suggest again if you care to see how everything's still, even things that are not apparently three-dimensionally dancing with each other, they've already got their eye on each other. There's things going on that you don't know about. And that is why there are certain areas that seem to be more inherently enthused with energy, just in ordinary affairs, than some others. How many people get excited about just the general nature of uh, seasonings or refurbishing shoes or you follow? But then there seems to be areas that people say are within themselves more enthusiastic. They have more inherent power into them. And that would normally be areas like religion, philosophy, psychology, morals. Now I am saying that you should be able to feel that they do not, at the ordinary level, actually have their own innate enthusiasm. You have to participate in it. But notice that the, the areas that it would seem to be, notice where they are. Well, my hint was they are in the very places that you would expect, although they're, they're not really right now inherent carriers of their own high power. But I was just trying to give you some notion of why there are certain ones of them that seem to be drawn in the human perception closer to the notion that there's some ideas, there's some thought processes, some concepts that are more enthusiastic, that are more high-powered, they're more volatile than others. And worrying about what's the nature of life is just more to everybody. It's just got to be more inspiring. It's got to be more energy-producing, I'm just sure it is, than worrying about what, what difference has been made since they have begun to use man-made products on the uppers and lowers of Western shoes. I could then also, as you might expect, suggest that you try and initiate, right now even, a kind of adding to, a kind of enthusiasm, except there is no word beyond the ordinary one, but it comes close to what was noted earlier that through a kind of close directed control over your own internal data system, it's almost as though you can begin to initiate, get a taste for the kinds of information that is already, that is the signals already have information and are within themselves already high voltage. through holding a kind of close directed control of your own system, which is the ultimate freedom. <laughs> Try this then. The B 
bigger, this is in the ordinary sense, the bigger the organization, the institution, the system, the weaker is its signal. Enough said. <laughs>